Good evening, welcome. So glad you could join us this evening. The League of Women Voters of Butte County is a civic organization. The League nationally was founded in 1920 to encourage informed citizen participation in government and to encourage women to play a larger role in public affairs. The League of Women Voters does not support or oppose candidates or political parties. It is the intent of every candidate forum to provide an opportunity for candidates to present their views on important issues facing Butte County voters. The League of Women Voters is held in high regard for its commitment to fair and unbiased forums. The League Forum rules are designed to continue this respected tradition. The candidates in the first forum have drawn for order of opening and closing statements prior to the beginning of this forum and are seated in the order of the opening statement draw. Each candidate will be given one minute for an opening statement and one minute for a closing statement. Answers to our questions will also be limited to one minute. Each question will be answered by each of the candidates. The moderators may adjust the times depending on time restrictions or complexities of the subject. The audience and lead questions will be read by a moderator. The journalists will ask questions directly to the candidates when called upon by the moderator. At the end of this forum, we will thank all the candidates with our applause. Please hold your applause until that time. I am pleased to introduce our moderators for this evening's forums, Mary Jensen and Jane Wanderer. Thank you. Here is some information about the Butte County Board of Supervisors and the role these people are hoping to assume. The Butte County Board of Supervisors consists of five members, each of whom is elected from the district in which he or she resides. Each supervisor represents nearly the same number in population. The current annual county budget is $535 million. The office has a four-year term without term limits. Each supervisor serves on numerous commissions in addition to two monthly meetings. The supervisor's salary is $59,284 plus car allowance. Both District 2 and 3 represent large neighborhoods of Chico. More information about the district and the scope of their supervisor's responsibilities can be found on the Butte County website. Representing the press for this forum are Steve Schoonover of Chico Enterprise Record and the Oroville Register and Asia Tirago of Chico News and Review. The following offices will appear on the primary election ballot and that includes the ones we're talking about tonight, the supervisor and assessor. A candidate may be elected to these offices if they receive the majority of the votes cast, that would be 50% plus one vote, and could be elected then at the primary election, should they reach that level. If no candidate receives the majority of votes cast in the race, the two candidates who receive the highest number of votes will have their names placed on the general election ballot. I think we're ready to start. I want to explain a little bit how this will go. You all have one minute to answer each question. We're going to rotate the questions, maybe one from the league, one from the press, one from the audience, and we'll take it that way. So, Mr. Wall, would you like to start with your opening statement, please? Good evening, and thank you, Jane, and thank you all for being here, and I want to thank the League of Women Voters for hosting this. Uh, every, every time it gets bigger and better, so thank you, thank you again. I have lived in uh, District 2 for over 40 years of my life. I'm a product of Chico Schools, Chico State, and I've served in the U.S. Navy for 23 years as a Navy pilot, uh, serving in combat, two tours uh, flying over North Vietnam and Laos. After leaving the Navy, I reconnected with my uh, childhood sweetheart, Mary Fano. We got married and we opened a business. We began with one store and uh, subsequently grew to three stores uh, in Chico, a local, local business hiring uh, many college students who needed to work to get through school. And so it was our pleasure to do that for 25 years. Uh, during that time, I became involved with uh, the Planning Commission and ultimately the City Council and now the Board of Supervisors. Thank you. 
Uh, my name is Deborah Lucero, and I have a long, rich history in Butte County. My mother's family goes back to my great-great-grandfather, who had the first hotel and store, and which is now under um, Lake Oroville in Enterprise, and my great-great-grandfather, T.J. Lucas, who had a farm, a large ranch that in Bidwell Bar, and his son also had one. Uh, I went to Chico State. Um, I was born here, as were my... Uh, at, my parents were also went to Chico State. Uh, we, um, I graduated with a communications degree and an emphasis in Spanish and also Latin American studies. My first job was at a Hispanic lobbyist group in Washington, D.C., and then I worked for newspapers for about eight years. I started a business when I was 25, manufacturing futons and selling furniture, and I have three children, and they all live on the West Coast very happily, and I look forward to this uh, forum. Thank you. Now, Mr. Evans, will you go first? For I got it. Notice everybody starts to talk faster once that 15 second sign comes up. <laughs> I'm Bob Evans, and I, I also want to thank the League for, for this important debate. It's really important for people to become educated on who their potential uh, supervisors are. I am not a local product. I was born and raised in the Midwest, got my college degree in economics, and was off to Texas for pilot training in the Air Force. I spent the next 20 years in the Air Force, retired, oh my God, already? Retired uh, as a lieutenant colonel, met my wife in Sacramento, and we moved to Chico to raise a family and, start, and go to work. I became the plant manager for a company called Life Touch National School Studios, and for the next 17 years, I ran that operation, and every year, we improved it and made and made improvements and uh, lowered costs. So that is a great training ground for the position I am trying to get. Stop. Thank you, Jane. Um, thank you to the league for having us. This is a very quick election cycle, and as a newbie to the uh, running an election, I can't believe how fast it's gone, and I really appreciate you ho uh, hosting us tonight. Uh, my name is Norm. I grew up in District 3. I went to Pleasant Valley High School. I went to UC Davis, went to UC San Francisco School of Dentistry, came back, practiced dentistry, started a winery, uh, served two terms on the Butte County Airport Land Use Commission, uh, started uh, Jet Chico, which is a group trying to bring back commercial air service, uh, helped found the uh, Chico Air Museum, which uh, is an air museum out at the airport. And um, the reason I'm running is I just don't like what's going on in Chico. I think things have changed for the worst. I think we need to make some changes, and I think we need some new leadership to do that. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate the League having us here tonight, and I take the League's encouragement for women to get involved in public affairs very seriously, so I really appreciate this opportunity. I'm a 20-year resident of Butte County, and I have about 20 years working in the social services. I'm the founding executive director of the Torres Community Shelter, the past executive director of Habitat for Humanity of Butte County, a former alcohol and drug counselor, and I've previously provided offender treatment services for three years. Um, I have two master's degrees, one in counseling and one in restorative justice, and I was elected to the Chico City Council in 2012. I served until 2016. Um, I currently work as the Director of Family Court Services for Glen County Superior Court as a professional mediator and a child custody recommending counselor. Okay, we'll start the one minute uh, answer questions with Ms. Lucero. And the question is one from the League. Mary? There is currently a general concern for transparency in governmental affairs. How do you believe this issue affects Butte County? Well, one issue that I know of is that currently there is no way to tell how supervisors, board of supervisors, even vote on any given subject. The only way you can do that is to dig through the minutes and look through those minutes and then go down each one and see how they voted. One of the first things I would like to do is transparency for a trans, <coughs> excuse me, transparency concept is get this, it's the digital, digital age, let's have some kind of 
um, glossary, and in that glossary you can tell how every supervisor voted, whether it's a land use issue, whether it's septics, whether it's on the environment, whether it's on uh, the dam, whatever it may be, whether it's on the green line. This is a good place to start because then it makes it easy for the public to go in and check it out and, de and determine how our elected officials are representing us. Thank you. Mr. Evans? Well, my experience uh, is mostly with the city of Chico, which I don't think is much different from the county uh, as being on the city council and, and currently on the planning commission. We all follow the Brown Act rules, which mean you can't have meetings outside of a quorum of or a majority of the members of a board or council. And, and I know the, count, the county all, also does that. However, during... <coughs> Uh, a recent incident in the city with behind closed doors was uh, brought to light with the movement of the Jesus Center and uh, certainly the press is here to make sure that transparency is always uh, part of the process uh, and I have no doubt will be called to order if in fact those rules are violated. Mr. Rosine. Thank you. Um, I hate to agree with Bob, but Bob's exactly right. The Brown Act is there for a reason. It's there for a purpose. We need to avoid uh, any appearance of not being transparent. The recent city council meeting that, that had a problem is, is something that needs to be avoided. I think the county does a good job. I think you can look and see how people vote. But I do agree that it, everything that we do for the public should be out in the open and be part of the process. Thank you, Ms. Ritter. So regarding transparency, the area that I see that is the most critically important is the budget. And when working with the city of Chico, um, there was a lot of work that was done to revise the way in which the budget was provided to the counselors and available to the public. And I would like to see that same process take place on the county level. Currently, when you try to look at a county budget, you have to look at multiple documents because there are multiple places that show what funding sources are coming from where and so what I would like to see is I would like to see all of that information contained in one document that's easy to read just like the cities have implemented. Thank you Mr. Wall. Transparency is a shared uh, endeavor. You know, it requires the work on all of our parts not just the county or the city to provide transparent notes or minutes uh, which are all available online uh, if you don't happen to watch the uh, actual meeting in progress. You can, you can pick up the minutes uh, at a later time. You can look at our local newspapers. They frequently have the major items uh, with the who voted what uh, in them. And it's a responsibility that citizens need to take upon themselves uh, in the area of transparency. We provide uh, transparency in all matters at the county. We're very good at that. All five of us agree that transparency is extremely important. The budget is transparent. And it comes out in June and is available for everybody to read. It, uh, it'll be online, it'll be in the local libraries, it'll be in the county buildings. Uh, and if you want to look at it, you can certainly do that. Thank you. This is a question from an audience member. When budgets are fully allocated to existing programs, the questions about new programs are answered by, what do you want us to stop doing? Is there anything you believe the county should stop doing? So let's back up. And the response to that question asked of a, of a supervisor is pretty uh, germane. Uh, the county is on a very, very tight budget. In fact, it's getting tighter as the year go, goes on. Revenues are going up, but expenses are going up faster. So if you want to add something new, you have to eliminate something bad. Or that's less of a priority. My top priority is public safety, and that's on the police or sheriff and the fire side. I believe that should be where the priority is for any government. And in order to facilitate that, I'm really going to have to dig through the, through the piles and the departments to, to see where a less prioritized item can be eliminated without hurting people. I don't have a specific answer at this point, but that's one of the things I'll be looking for. Thank you, Mr. Rosine. 
Yeah, I, it, it comes down to prioritizing every single item in the county budget. Right now, we're pretty much bare bones. Where do you cut when you've already cut so much? So uh, I would take a long look at the budget, and I would, some programs, maybe you could cut them back. I don't know if you have to eliminate a program to gather another program, but perhaps you can reduce a program and make it more efficient. I think with technology, we can do that sometimes and gain some money from that program by using technology and use that saved money for a new program or an additional program. I don't suggest that we cut any programs, regardless of whether we want to add new ones. I think that what this comes down to is collaboration, and that we need to be making sure that the cities and the county are working together. If there are programs that are being duplicated or services that are being duplicated, then we look at um, trying to eliminate those duplications and just streamline the services. Thank you. Mr. Wall. I think when it comes right down to it, it's very difficult to cut an existing program that has been approved by not only staff, but by the, the five members of the board and uh, many members of the community. The, the budgets uh, will grow and will expand, and as we get new money, more things can be added. However, you look at the library, there's one that is seesawed back and forth, going up and down. Uh, it depends on... Uh, on what, uh, what money needs to be placed where. Public safety obviously gets a first crack at uh, in money. Uh, the other ones uh, will take second fiddle, and any new programs will uh, join the queue to be placed uh, when it's their turn. Thank you. Ms. Lucero? Well, I think we need to look at the efficacy of programs. Um, right now, uh, there is an enforcement program with cannabis, and there are large liens being, uh, being leaned on properties that are found to be in violation. They have, there's about $2 million in liens, but last year they only collected $168,000 of those liens. What I'm wondering is, are there other programs like that that we can look at the efficacy of these programs? How much is it costing us to do a program like that? And then from there, uh, look into the other parts of the budget. There might be hidden pots. Uh, it's very tight. I've been looking at the budget myself, but I'm, it really all goes back to how effective are those programs? Looking at mental health, how can we collaborate? I agree with Ms. Ritter. You know, we need more collaboration between the city and the county. The, the county should be front and center on the homeless issue with 51% of its budget um, budgeted towards health and mental health services. Thank you. I think now we'll take a question from each of the press. So we'll start with Mr. Schoonover of the Chico Enterprise Record. Just for the record, the county had come up with something that sounds like what you're looking for, Ms. Ritter. Uh, it's called OpenGov. I believe it went active today. It's an interactive thing that you can basically scroll down through the county budget. It's pretty cool. My question concerns what uh, Ms. Lucera brought up, um, the county's program to uh, control marijuana groves. Um, I'm interested in your views on how that is done, uh, the philosophy behind it and all that, but for the record, the county does not enforce uh, its marijuana growing rules through the criminal courts, but rather through zoning ordinances. Uh, a grow that violates the ordinance is declared a public nuisance, and then they can collect fines on it, and they do place liens on them, they amount to tens of thousands of dollars, and they've had as many as 15 of them in a single meeting to approve. So again, I'm just interested in your views on that program. Mr. Rosine? Yeah. Um, yeah, I've been to the meetings where they had 15 hearings, and it, it was uh, a long, long meeting. Um, I, I think what was stated was that everybody knows the law, okay? The law has been put out there for over a year, and still we get people violating uh, the marijuana um, ordinance. Uh, I think that what the supervisor said at a meeting uh, last month was we're not going to do this next year. Next year you understand the law and we're going to hold you accountable for the law. We have laws for reasons, okay? We're a, a society of laws and I think we need to enforce the law. I agree with the ordinance as it's written right now. I think it's doing a good job. I think it's trying to keep people from uh, growing more marijuana that they use to sell, not for themselves. And I think that I would support the current ordinance as it's currently written. All right. 
Thank you, Ms. Ritter. Yes, I think that the current system of making it a land use issue over a criminal issue is smart, and I think that that's moving in the correct direction. Um, what I don't like about it is that there is no consistent enforcement even as a land use issue. When we observed those 15 uh, hearings that took place, there were some people who got three month extensions. There were some people who were immediately, the lien was going on their property. And when one of the supervisors inquired as to why certain people were getting longer terms than others, um, the response of another supervisor was, I don't feel I should have to justify my answers. So I think that it's really critical that we have a policy that works and that it is enforceable and it is consistent. Mr. Wall. Over the past six and a half uh, years, we've gone through many iterations of the local marijuana, both medical and recreational laws, to uh, conform with state law and uh, try to conform somewhat to federal law. It's been very difficult, but uh, six and a half years later, here we are. We have the unanimous consent of all five supervisors that the way we're doing it now is as good as we can get it. It's balanced, it's collaborative, it's, uh, it's an ordinance that uh, it is working and we're gonna give it time to work. And we're gonna review it uh, next month to see if uh, we need to make any changes and I, for one, don't see any changes to be made. The, uh, the way we go about collecting money and uh, imposing liens uh, is as fair as we can get it. It's in accordance with uh, the most state and federal law. So I uh, support staying where we are at the, on this issue. Ms. Lucero? Well, as I said, my real question on this particular um, item is I'd just like to know how much it costs. I haven't seen a cost and expenditure sheet compared to what we're bringing in and what it's costing us. And if it's getting down to we're bringing in $2 million, but we're only bringing in 168000 in revenue, maybe we need to review that. Thank you. Mr. Evans? Right. I really think that, that the county is being smart in the way they're approaching this. Uh, if we wanted to do pr pr criminal prosecutions and involve the courts and involve lawyers, it gets very expensive, it gets very muddy, it gets very dragged out. Using land use is clean, it's effective, it does what it's supposed to do, and that is keep a limit, uh, keep a regulation that allows small grows but not commercial grows. So, I honestly think land use is a very smart approach to this problem. Thank you. The next question will come from the Chico News and Review. As you know, California is experiencing a housing crisis right now, and the county is not immune to that. Um, what are your ideas or what are your solutions to addressing that, and how, what role can the supervisors even take on? Should there be flexibility with the green line, or should it be a rigid demarcation? Thanks. Yes. So we're gonna combine the housing and green line question. I'll just hit the green line part first. No, we shouldn't move the green line. Um, as far as what we should do to address the housing crisis that we are facing in Butte County, I think that the first thing that we need to do is we need to make sure that our continuum of care is as strong as it can possibly be. One of the things that is currently weakening our continuum of care is the legislation that the city of Chico enacted that criminalize homelessness, things like the sit lie ordinance. Those things are not approved by any housing organization anywhere in the country. They're seen to be detrimental to addressing homelessness. They criminalize homelessness and they don't help. They end up costing jurisdictions more money. So I think it's critical that as a community we say these kinds of policies are not beneficial. They're costing us $50,000 from the Department of Housing and Community Development and I think that that's the first thing we need to do is reverse those kinds of policies. Mr. Wall. The California State Legislature has imposed a lot of regulations on us that uh, make building housing uh, very difficult. Uh, one just recently, uh, yesterday or today, added the requirement that in two years you be putting on uh, solar and uh, solar storage capability into your homes. That's going to add another twelve to 20000 per home. The price of the homes here in Butte County is already approaching $315,000. And the reason for that is there's not enough land being utilized for building for homes. 
We need to make more land available. I don't support uh, changing the green line, but uh, we need to find other areas where, where housing can be done. The county is, is working on this, and the city will need to annex housing as it becomes available. The other thing is uh, the tiny houses. Tiny houses can work for transitional living for those who, uh, who are willing to uh, make a go of it and move on to, to new housing. Uh, we don't have enough time to house everybody, but uh, we're working on it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lucero. Well, I agree, tiny houses, um, single uh, occupancy places for residents. I think we need to go up in Chico and not continue to spread out. We are running out of land, uh, and I am a protector of the Green Line. I absolutely believe in the Green Line. If you've ever seen it, it's super jagged, and there's a reason for that. It was a political battle 40 years ago, and it was difficult to get that land into conservation the way it is or into farmland. So we need to be creative, and we need to look at the housing changes. Um, people are wanting different types of housing today. Millennials uh, want to live in apartments. They don't want to live on one acre uh, lots with a house. So um, I think it's a combination of being smart about what is new and what is needed and what millennials would like. You know, what is the new housing going to look like? And also utilizing our existing space, infill and going up. Mr. Evans. So it's interesting that the state finally realized that we have a housing shortage. I think most people realized that a long time ago. In fact, in Chico, if you take all the permits, all the plans, all the developments, including Merriam Park and including Stonegate, which hasn't even started yet, if you have put all those housing units, they add up to about 3,200 houses, homes. The, the demand estimate based on the uh, general plan is by 2030, we're going to need 17,000 homes for growth. And there's another estimate that, uh, that comes in at 7,000 plus. Either of those means we still need more, we need double the houses we have. Larry's right in that, I got to go fast, don't I? <laughs> there's not enough land available to, to, to build all these homes, and when there's a scarcity of land, the price of land goes up. I do not want to, to uh, avoid the green line. We need to protect that. But some of the other boundaries that are encircling Chico probably okay. are going to have to be looked at. Thank you. Mr. Rosine? Yeah. Regarding the green line, I'm a strong supporter of the green line. Um, I have an ag business myself. I live on ag land. We need to protect the deep soils of the green line, and I think it's done a great job, and I think we're all in agreement. We've answered that question at four different forums, so I think we know what we're doing. As far as housing goes, um, we need to find land. It needs to be probably marginal grazing land, the poorer soils of the region. Uh, we need to make that available, and we need to look to the state and say, look, you guys keep adding regulations that add to the cost of housing. The, the mean housing price in California right now is $550,000. Less than a third of the population can afford that. So something has to give. And here locally, I think if we could free up some of the marginal grazing lands, that aren't good for agriculture and make it available, then that would do a lot towards solving our housing crisis. Thank you. Now we'll have a question from the League of Women Voters, and after it's read, the first person to answer will be Mr. Wall. In your opinion, what are the outstanding problems facing the county, short term and long term? And what personal priorities do you place on dealing with them? The short-term and long-term uh, problems facing the county is public safety. Uh, we've seen our fire department shrink in size. We need to, need to try to get that back up. We've seen our police department uh, pretty much, or our sheriff's department pretty much stabilize where it is now. Yet there's uh, pockets of the uh, county, uh, particularly up in the mountains, that uh, are not served well, are not served 24 hours a day on some days. We need to work on that. Ho housing is one of the other big issues that uh, is a long-term and a short-term. We need short-term housing for, for people who, uh, who are on the edge. We need long-term housing for everybody who comes here. 
and again, that's a function of land use. Uh, the land uh, is available, and we just have to have the willpower to go after it and make use of it in a way that satisfies the requirement for homes for uh, low, middle, and upper income folks. Uh, we have people moving in from, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wall. Ms. Lucero? Uh, yes, I, um, I really think the budget is very important. Uh, we are facing a budget deficit, I believe, in the next budget cycle. And so the first question that went to, well, what would we do without? I think that's why we have to look at our, our services and the way we're doing things. I think we need to be smarter about how we're doing things. I think we need to look at collaborative efforts between the city and the, the cities and the county. I think we need to look at a regionalism, perhaps. We've gone to Cal Fire in the county on fire. We may need to look at some um, innovative ways to partner with the cities. City of Oroville is looking at, at going bankrupt. How are they going to protect their citizens? They just annexed a huge part to their city. So this, we're all in this together. If one, if one city goes down, it doesn't bode well for the county. So we really need to figure these things out. And it's going to be through the budget. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Well, Ms. Lucero actually hit it. Uh, the budget is a big issue because even though revenues are going up, expenses are going up faster. And the county predicts that there will be layoffs at the end of, before the end of the year, uh, which is not the position anybody wants to be in. But just as they're doing, while they're trying to squeeze more out of every employee, the states come in and added more burden to the county. So the state putting more mandates on the county and they've upped the requirements for administration and in reporting back to the state. So it's a double-edged sword. Our, our, our revenue is not going up fast enough and the state is really putting much more demand on the county uh, with mandated programs, which I hope I get a chance to talk to before this evening is over. Mr. Rosine. Sure. Um, the budget is, is looming over us, so that is a short-term problem that we really need to deal with. Uh, public safety, both from a fire and a crime prevention and, and dealing with crime is, is huge. Uh, we need to try to maintain our staffing at levels that are appropriate and will work. Homelessness is an acute problem right now. Uh, when I go to different seminars and talk to people, they're all asking me, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Um, Long-term growth. The county's going to decide where the city grows. That's the way it works. We're in control of the land outside the city. Are we going to grow south, north, east, along 99? Where are we going to grow? The county's going to play a huge role in that. And economic development. We haven't talked about that at all. We need commercial air service in Chico. That's one reason I'm up here. Uh, if we had commercial air service, we wouldn't have lost the Google Loon project. We wouldn't have lost the Facebook presence in Chico. We're losing tech companies that would come here and bring good jobs that can help the, our economy. Uh, and that's what we need. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, now we have a question from the audience. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> don't, uh, please don't take it personally. <laughs> Ms. Ritter. I get an extra 15 seconds for that. You need a big uh, so, <laughs> so I'm going to go through my priorities. Um, obviously, that's the, the things that I think that are facing the county that are the most dire. The single greatest thing that I think that we're going to need to deal with as a county is water policy. Um, it is going to become the single biggest issue in the North State. There is a grab right now for the North State's water. And unless we implement policy that protects us, not just now, but into the future, it is going to be the biggest issue. We we need to deal with our housing crisis. Homelessness, homelessness has a direct impact on our law enforcement. So if we implement housing first policies, uh, we free up law enforcement to deal with the legal issues that they are meant to be dealing with. The last is emergency preparedness. We need to make sure that our communication systems are in place before the next emergency. We saw how critical that was last year. And we know from some of the drills that we've done this year that there are some gaps and that we need to make sure that as a county we are prepared. Thank you, and my apologies, Ms. Ritter. Um, our next question is one from the audience. Um, after that, after it's read, Ms. Lucero will be the first to answer. Is there enough water for new large developments? What is your general view on water and water transfers and droughts? And transfers is in quotes. 
Well, I think Tammy just hit the nail on the head. You know, we, water policy is going to be critical. Um, there is a new state policy that is forcing counties to work together um, through Sigma, which finally the state figured out that the water doesn't realize when it's um, crossing a county line. And so we are becoming more educated about our aquifers. We still don't know how groundwater recharges. And so some of these things are going to be critical in the next four years. As for transfers, my understanding is that Butte County is like a swimming pool and we live in the shallow end of the swimming pool. The deep end of that aquifer pool is in Glen County. So we are going to have to work together with other counties. We are going to have to be regional. And this gets back to what I really truly believe. We are going to have to start being more regional to make effective change for the future. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Well, it's hard to say anything different, but, but the water issue it is and will be critical. Uh, Sigma it is a program that the state has come down with, and the good news is they've left it up to local authorities to determine how to implement it. It basically says, come up with a program that, set, that says you are not drawing any more water out of the ground than it's being replenished through natural replenishment. So everybody's looking at those programs. Uh, a couple things, uh, water transfers, uh, Butte County a long time ago put in a law that says you cannot sell your surface water to downstream users and then replenish it by pumping. So the, the county's been very smart in that regard. There is water that belongs to the Butte County in Lake Orville, and I know there is some exploratory uh, programs going along, how we can use that. There's enough water there to water the, the whole city of Chico throughout the year that we just aren't using because we have no conveyance uh, set up to take advantage of that. By the way, we will let the candidate finish a sentence, even though the stop sign has gone up. No Thank extra you. sentence, just finish the one you're on. Uh, Mr. Rosine? Yeah, so water is our most precious resource, and everyone else in the state wants our water. Uh, Sigma is going to help. It's going to define the aquifers and what we need to do to make them sustainable. We do know how groundwater recharges. It comes from the sky and it goes into the ground. We need to preserve that and understand it so that we can better map it and create sustainable groundwater plans that will work. Okay? I will fight for water transfers. I, I won't fight. I will protect against water transfers because it is such uh, a terrible thing that the state is moving our water, our only natural resource that they really want, away from uh, us. And we must protect against that, and we must fight against that. And that's why we need supervisors that can react and act at the state level and lobby for urban or for rural interests against the urban interests. I haven't heard anyone talk about that, but this is really a rural versus urban situation, and we need to continue to fight for rural interests and not let the urban interests take over. Thank you, Ms. Ritter. <laughs> So the question was, how do I feel about transfers and is there enough for new developments? Yes, there's absolutely enough for new developments. The, the use of the water that we need to be concerned with is the water that's being transferred to water orchards and plants that are growing south of the delta that should not be growing south of the delta. It is not appropriate places for us to be having those kinds of crops and that is gonna be the single biggest issue. Yes, Sigma will help but what Sigma is gonna determine is who gets a seat at that table. And right now, when you talk with the ag community, they are, not, they are the, currently the ones that will be represented. And my belief is that every single one of us, every single one of us is a water user and every single one of us should be represented on that board. Thank you. Uh, could you hold your applause, please, Mr. Wall? You know, groundwater belongs to the owner of the property above it, and in Butte County, we don't transfer that water south. I, uh, I'm very concerned when people talk about, uh, well, we can sell water south. Uh, it just is not something we can do. We can't afford to do that. Uh, the tunnels are a bad idea. The county has opposed them. The board has unanimously forwarded letters along with other counties to the governor's office, to the legislature. Uh, trying to prevent the tunnels from being built. I do support Sites Reservoir. 
Uh, we need more water storage up here. Uh, if we have more droughts, we're going to need more water. Uh, we have water in Oroville that uh, could be used here in Chico and elsewhere, but uh, the conveyance uh, is not available right now, and we uh, we don't don't have any means of getting it uh, getting it over here. So. You know, the water uh, sigma is just a management tool to keep the state from uh, deciding how our water is going to be used. Thank you. Now we'll take a question, just one question from the press. We'll do the Chico News and Review, have a couple more questions from either the audience or the league, and then do the Chico Enterprise Record. So, Ms. Saragra. All right, I have to keep remembering to turn it on. Um, so my question is, what is your stance on the Machupta tribe's proposal to build a casino? Well, I wish it weren't so, but they have all legal right to do it, uh, according to the courts. And I think the county is, is, uh, needs to stop fighting it because at this point it's gonna be a waste of money. I, my personal opinion, we have enough uh, casinos around that we don't need another one, but uh, I don't think the county ought to be fighting their tribal rights to do what they want with that land. Mr. Rosine? Um, yeah, we've, it's been settled in a court of law. I think we've spent enough time and money on it. I do think we have enough casinos, but uh, they have a legal right to do it. And uh, I think that if they're gonna go forward, the best we can do is try to do some good planning and avoid traffic issues and avoid the issues that might surround it uh, as far as uh, other issues so uh, I think we're gonna watch it develop and see what happens I'm not sure how different these these answers are going to be I believe that the county has spent enough money um, fighting this project and they are a sovereign people and they get to build this project if this is the project they choose to build what I would like to see is um, I would hope that there would be a willingness to work with the county on finding either a more appropriate site or um, or trying to mitigate the issues that are going to come up, not just in terms of um, where they're going to get water and how the waste is going to be uh, worked out in that particular area, but there's also a lot of law enforcement issues that come about uh, with the construction of casinos. So, um, so I would love to see, um, you know, perhaps a task force or a group from the county that is working directly with the tribe to help them um, mitigate those issues. Thank you, Mr. Wall. The Butte County Board of Supervisors has firmly agreed not to continue the legal action against the Machubdas. Uh, after having spent somewhat over $800,000 to this point uh, on a futile effort, uh, we are now moving into the next phase, and that's working with the Machupta to make sure we get as good a project as we possibly can uh, whether they build a casino, whether they build a hospital, whatever it is, but we need to work on access into that land. We need to work on uh, the, wa the water and where it will come from, how the sewer and other uh, things will be taken care of. But we will be working closely with the tribe to, uh, to accomplish all of that over the next few years. And it will take a few years to get anything done. They need to find a financing agent uh, and then proceed from there. So things are on track. Uh, the board is uh, firmly uh, firmly on, on track with the, the next phase of this endeavor. Ms. Lucero. I um, also agree with everything that's been said. Um, the Machupta are a sovereign nation and it's taken them many years and a huge court battle to get here and so I wish them well and I believe that as Mr. Wall said, we look to the future and help with the infrastructure needs. And if they're like the other um, tribes, I'm sure that we'll have a good working relationship with them and could mitigate hopefully any issues that would come up. Thank you, now we'll have a question from the audience. And the first person to answer will be Mr. Rosine. Homeless individuals have consumed most cities in California and the West Coast. Affordable housing is the most dramatic singular factor. What ideas do you have to help Chico and Butte County? Um, 
I think I agree with a lot of the people, uh, both at the city level and the county level, that are looking at developing a comprehensive program to deal with homelessness. It's going to take behavioral health people, it's going to take law enforcement, it's going to take the target teams, uh, the crisis intervention teams. And as far as uh, the housing goes, I think the tiny homes are part of the solution. I think CHAT is doing a good job with what they're trying to accomplish. I think it's time for everybody to get together and work in the same direction. For the last several years, we've kind of had this group and that group and this group and that group trying to find a solution on their own. It's not going to happen that way. There, it's too complex an issue. It's eating up a lot of budgets. It's eating up, as you said, a lot of cities. Uh, we need to deal with it, but we need to do it together, and we need to move forward together on that. Ms. Ritter. So I think that the first thing that we need to do as a community is to be offering housing first. If we offer housing first options and low barrier shelters, we are going to directly affect law enforcement who are not the appropriate um, entity to be responding to housing and homeless crisis. We're going to alleviate the burden on hospitals as well as our courts. Um, the Greater Chico Homeless Task Force has been in operation since 1998, and they have been coordinating services within Chico since that time. Since the Federal Emergency Shelter Grant and the Emergency Housing Assistance Program have been uh, restructured, we now have the Continuum of Care, another countywide organization that has been working for years and years to coordinate homeless services. So I think we have all of the agencies that we need. What we need to do is we need to be getting the full funding for our Continuum of Care by getting rid of policies that criminalize homelessness. Mr. Wall. There are some 50 groups that uh, are working on this problem uh, throughout the county and particularly in Chico. Homelessness is something that's been talked about for many years and it's finally coming to that point to where people are gathering together and saying we're going to do something. I support the move of the Jesus Center to a new location so they can be a, an entry point for more services, take care of more people, and be less of a problem for their neighbors on Park Avenue. I support the uh, tiny house uh, concept as long as it's run properly, managed properly, and the people uh, who are al allowed to be in there are, uh, are well screened. Uh, I've seen it in action in Portland. Uh, my sister and I up there visited uh, their, their shelter up there in, in Portland, and it worked, worked very well. And this has been several years ago, so I understand the ones uh, in the local areas are working well also. The, the, homes, the homes for people... You're so good. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Lucero? Well, I, um, this is a very concerning problem to me, and I really do believe that the county should be front and center on this issue because it has the resources. Um, the Department of Behavioral Health Services is a $67 million department, and I believe that we could be coordinating in a better way. The continuum of care even though it's designed to bring everyone together, I have yet to hear people who are actually in the field believing that it works well. Many people say it does not work well. Uh, we need detox centers. Uh, we need mental health facilities. We need to work on um, a 24-hour place just right here in Chico that can take someone who ends up going to our local hospital who has a mental illness, we don't have anywhere to take them. We don't have a 24-hour facility here that, well, we do, but they are not going to respond. Now, we do have a new crisis mobile unit, but it's only operating from 8 to 6. Mr. Evans? Well, homelessness is a, a very, very tough issue. It's very complicated. Uh, the reasons for being homeless are, are, very, are varied, and hence the solutions. There is not a solution. It just has to be a whole variety of efforts chipping away at, at all the edges uh, for the reasons that people are homeless. And Larry's right. There's many, many organizations out there that are now working on this problem, and not just government agencies. Private citizen groups are working on on helping to raise the issue and the solutions to homelessness. I agree with moving the Jesus Center where, where more services can be given uh, to a greater number of people and uh, instead of uh, trying to find them all over, all over the place. I, 
I believe that uh, housing is an integral part of the solution. Where that housing is going to be is, is a tough decision because I think most people agree that housing it should be an integral part of the solution and it says stop. Thank you. Now a question from the Chico Enterprise record, Mr. Schoonover. A couple of weeks back the supervisors approved sending a letter to the governor of the legislature opposing two of the uh, sanctuary laws that were in effect uh, basically because they contradict completely with federal law and it was putting uh, law enforcement and business in a position of having to either choose to violate federal law or choose to violate state law. Um, the comments from the public at the time were of two types. Uh, one said, uh, you, you don't need to do this, the state, the state law is just fine, you're all a bunch of racists. The other point of view was, uh, you need to go farther, you need to join the lawsuit that the federal government has undertaken to, uh, to overturn those laws like, like Orange County did. Uh, so my question is kind of a, 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 a Goldilocks question. Did the county go too far? Did they not go far enough? Or did they do the right thing? Once again, the uh, Board of Supervisors unanimously voted to approve the letter. Oh, Mr. And, Wall, and Mr. Wall, I think it's Miss Ritter. <laughs> oh, my apologies. <laughs> Just too anxious to answer I, the question. I should have said that before I let him read the question. Okay, Miss Ritter. <laughs> that, that doesn't count as my opinion, okay? All right. Um, <laughs> So there are lots of incidents that we're going to see where the state law and the federal law are, are not the same. Um, we can look at one of the earlier questions regarding cannabis or, um, or policy around that. And so um, I, my personal position is that um, because our law allows that if there is someone who is a violent criminal and they are arrested, um, that law enforcement can already work with immigration, um, I absolutely support um, sanctuary. Now, Mr. Wall. I do not support the sanctuary. It's in strict violation of federal law. But the Board of Supervisors unanimously voted to send that letter off to the legislature and to the governor's office. And the reason being was that we did not want to get involved in the lawsuit that Orange County and San Diego County and, and now other jurisdictions are, are entering into because it could prove to be extremely expensive and we're not a county, a county that can afford to do that. What we did is make our voice heard and we did discuss uh, becoming, becoming a friend of the court, uh, filing an amicus brief at some point when it's appropriate, uh, and that time is not yet, but uh, we will have that discussion in the future. The sheriff has a very difficult time walking that fine line between federal and state law, so he has made the decision to post all releases of the jail on the web, on our sheriff's website, so that ICE, if it wants, can come pick up the folks when they are released. Thank you, Ms. Lucero. I was there for that vote, and I was very disappointed that our county, which is an agricultural county who depends on migrant farm workers to pick our crops and to be in our fields and who have lived amongst us, that they would vote to do this. I, I was very disappointed. When the sheriff came up to explain, he said that they arrest about 12,000 people a year, and of those, 34 people in the jail were illegal. During that year, 34 were illegal aliens, and of those, 11 were deported. That didn't sound like a huge issue. I was wondering if, oh my gosh, is this a, a big issue? Is this something we need to be worried about? But instead, we have literally put out an unwelcome sign. And, and if you talk to farmers, it is impacting our county. It's impacting our agricultural well-being. And it's our number one industry. I don't agree with it at all. Mr. Evans? Well, I agree with uh, Larry Wall. I don't agree in sanctuary city or sanctuary state. Uh, I think it's, it's counter to federal law. More importantly, it puts our sheriff and all law enforcement in a very, very tough position. It's a damned if you do, damned if you don't. They can be, they can be charged with violating the law, either from the state or the federal, no matter which way they step. Uh, sheriff Honey's taken a very prudent and, and 
and a safe way to address a problem, but he's probably the exception in law, for, in law enforcement across the state. One thing I find interesting, and, and the uh, author of this uh, sanctuary state is Senator Kevin DeLeon. He came out with a statement that said, local communities and counties cannot choose which laws they want to enforce, which state laws they want to enforce, and which state laws they want to oppose. I find that rather ironic, seeing how he has made that statement between the state of California, choosing which federal laws they want to, I can finish the sentence, right? <laughs> which federal laws they want to obey and which federal laws they want to disregard because they don't like them. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Mr. Rosine? Yeah, we are, we are a nation of laws and we have mechanisms to change those laws if we don't like them, but we have to follow the laws while they exist. I don't agree with sanctuary cities or san sanctuary states. I think it's a mistake in that you do put your law enforcement personnel in this impossible situation. I've talked with Sheriff Honey directly about this and that's exactly what he said. It's like I, if I do this I'm in trouble, if I do that I'm in trouble. He has two masters. So I think uh, as a board of supervisors you have to put your sheriff who is your chief law enforcement person in a position where he can be successful and if we're gonna have this nation versus state tit for tat kind of going on well, we need to address it at the level that we can address it and not put our local people in a problematic situation. Thank you. Now we'll have a question from the League of Women Voters. And when after the question is read, we'll start with Mr. Wall. Do you find that all residents of Butte County are adequately served by existing transportation facilities? And if not, what remediations would you give priority support? Uh, no, not everybody has uh, what you would say is adequate. Uh, some people have cars, some people ride the bus, some people walk, some people uh, ride a bike. Uh, I don't think any of them are a perfect solution. There needs to be a, a very good mix. Uh, the automobile is something you choose to have if you can afford it. A bus ride is something most everybody can afford to do if it works with their schedule. Unfortunately, bus ridership is very low in this county and it's also very uh, very highly subsidized uh, even though there's a requirement to uh, to meet certain fare box uh, minimums uh, in the bus traffic uh, bicycles have uh, a great uh, deal of latitude in where they can go and they do have uh, improving bike lanes and uh, thoroughfares through town but it can get better uh, walking is relatively safe in this uh, town and this uh, county for those who uh, live within uh, walking distance of uh, their needed destination. Ms. Lucero. Uh, transportation I think goes hand in hand with affordable housing and I would like to see our county working on uh, again collaboratively with our cities to create affordable housing and transportation concepts. Reading was the recipient of one of the largest grants in the state. They got a $20 million grant to build an affordable housing complex in its downtown and it was because of the transportation element. So I think that we really need to be creative about this and again be collaborative and we can do that with our cities. Uh, I'm totally for biking I want to throw th this out there. Some people have said, what are we going to do about those Nord um, apartments and all the increased traffic? What about not having freshmen and sophomores bring cars to Chico State? Thank you. Mr. Evans? Well, I think it's all, almost impossible to, to have everybody served equally uh, because we have such a diverse location. So Forest Ranch, Cohasset, uh, the, the public the public service for their transportation is totally different than what would be in Chico or Orville for that matter. Uh, I do support uh, bike lanes and, and getting people out of cars. I live pretty close to the Esplanade near Chico High School and that, that has become just such a bottleneck and a scary situation for those kids who are, have to cross uh, the Esplanade to go to school. So yes, I support alternative methods, get out, walk, uh, bicycle, and public transportation, I think public transportation right now is goes to where the ridership is the highest because they certainly want to make sure that uh, those buses are utilized the most. So uh, I can't argue with that. 
Mr. Rosine? I think we need a mix of transportation techniques and methods. Um, different people have different needs. Uh, I strongly support um, bike routes. I went to college at UC Davis, which is the biking capital of the world, and everybody used their bikes there. So I, I like that idea. Chico's relatively flat. It works. I do think we need bus service that can get people to where they want to go. I'm going to take this opportunity again to talk about the airport and, and air transportation. 680 people a day travel down to Sacramento via car or bus or shuttle to fly out of here. Okay, that's a lot of traffic we put on the road when if we could attract a commercial air carrier, which is very doable, we could have airline service, we could attract professionals with that airline service, we could service tech businesses, and we would get those cars off the road, which is one goal of transportation. Thank you. Ms. Ritter? In addressing public transportation, I, I think that when we talk about bike lanes, we're talking about something different. Um, when we talk about public transportation, we're specifically talking about buses. And public transportation is overwhelmingly used by individuals who are either at or below the poverty line. And there are a lot of issues um, that BCAG is aware of, um, particularly with individuals with disabilities, the hours that buses run, the last, the last route that a bus takes, transportation on weekends. I served on the Social Services Transportation Advisory Committee, and basically, if we can't get ridership up, then we can't add more more buses and more routes and so it's kind of a um, it's kind of a problem that perpetuates itself because if we don't have convenient bu uh, times for people to get on the bus then people aren't going to ride it thank you now we'll have a question from the audience after which the first person to answer will be Deborah Lucero do you support an independent funding source for Butte County Library Yes, I support any funding source for Butte County Library. <laughs> I wish that we had created an endowment 20 years ago for the library. Um, that's something that Shasta County did. The Friends of the Library, I think it's a, it's a good way to go. I think that citizens need to be more involved. I would hate to see any um, public funds taken from the library because I think the library is an important source for many of our neediest citizens. So um, I absolutely support any kind of funding source, but I wouldn't want to see uh, government pull back its support because there was some other funding stream coming in. Thank you. Mr. Evans? Whatever the source, we need to support our libraries. As uh, Deborah said, it, it's critical to an awful large portion of our, of our communities. And every year, it seems like there's a tug of war between the city and the county and how much they're going to allow the, the library to have or can afford to let the library have. And then we're talking about shortening hours and days closed. Uh, an independent uh, source would be awesome. I don't know wh what would make that up, where that would come from. But if we could come up with an independent source of money that would allow the library to become stable and open to all the people who need it all the time. That would be a wonderful, wonderful answer. Mr. Rosine? Um, I'm a big believer of uh, public-private partnerships. I think that if you combine the public money that the library gets with a very active nonprofit that would help uh, support the library, I think that is a way to go. I think that the library is such an important asset, or the libraries are an important asset to the county, that um, with maybe a little bit more marketing, a little bit more pizzazz, we could do that. Um, I, I, I would use the Chico Air Museum as an example. We started with a bare patch of nothing, no airplanes. Now we're going to see 10,000 people a year in uh, visitors because you had a highly motivated group of people moving in the right direction at the same time. I think the library is just ripe for that, too. Ms. Ritter. So uh, a public-private, kind of like Friends of the Library? Um, I absolutely would support an independent funding source for the library. It's a county service and, and thus a county responsibility. Um, but I think that the county library um, does an excellent job at what they do. I think that they have some of the most um, long-term and long-standing volunteers in this community. And it's a, um, it's a 
it's an organization that everyone can get behind. So, and it's serving people from you know preschool age in the kids section up to seniors and and everyone in between. So yeah, I I support Friends of the Library and I support the county continuing to fund the library. Mr. Wall, as many of you know and many of you have participated. Uh, Library has been a passion of mine for many years, ever since I was a kid and would be down there on Saturday morning when the books were first put on the shelf by the librarian. The library, since the Carnegie days, have uh, evolved uh, from a research center, a book checkout place, to a myriad of uh, services, which should remain in the public realm. It's a public, uh, e public building and a public place that should be funded by public public money. The library does more than rent books now. It, it uh, has computer stations. It has learning stations. It has 3D, 3D printing. It has any number of things and it's a, a valuable place for people throughout the community to go. It's a place where you can go and look at this county budget. The Friends of the Library are the independent uh, assistance uh, to the library in uh, buying books for the library. And that will continue into the far-reaching future, I'm sure. Thank you. The next question, it will be the last question. Time runs out really fast. It'll be one from the league. And when the question is read, the first person to go will be Mr. Evans. What is your opinion of Butte County's current emergency response plan? What additional steps would you propose to ensure the safety of Butte County residents? Well, in light of uh, the crisis we had in Orville and the Orville Dam a few years ago, I know all those emergency response plans are being reviewed and updated as we speak. Uh, there's another emergency response area with, that needs attention, and that is for our, our uh, communities in the foothills and the fire dangers that, uh, that could devastate them if, if, if uh, well, if it happened to happen in our foothills. Uh, we just went to a meeting here a week ago or two weeks ago of the fire response up in Co up in uh, Forest Ranch, and those people are are well prepared, very knowledgeable of what they're supposed to do uh, in case of a fire. One of the problems that's happened is that. Since pot and marijuana grew in the foothills, a lot of the properties and escape routes have been have been fenced off. Sierra, the Sierra Lumber Company, who had many roads to escape from, have fenced off all those escape routes. So there has to be uh, another look at our foothill properties to make sure that uh, they have the proper avenues to get out in case of an emergency. Mr. Rosine. Yes, so uh, I'm Vice President of the North Valley Animal Disaster Group. I can tell you that Butte County is one of the best prepared small counties in the country based on what we did after the Orville Dam incident. There were meetings, there were discussions, there's been drills like the one at Forest Ranch recently. Okay, I don't know about communications, but we have Calm Reserve. We have some very, very excellent people working hard because they understand because of the wildfires we've had and because of the Orville Dam incident what they need to do. Having more drills is useful. NAVDAG's having a drill this coming Saturday. We need to practice. We have evacuation plans for all the Foothill communities. They've, they're very current. What we need to do is take a long look at fire routes out of Cohasset, out of Forest Ranch, and maybe use whatever funding we can get from the state, because the state is putting us in a lot of this fire danger, to develop some alternate routes so those areas are not um, limited by evacuation route problems. Ms. Ritter. Yes, I do think Butte County has a good emergency plan, um, but some of the issues that exist are things like we learned at the Forest Ranch evacuation drill is that if you don't have a landline, then they're using a different system than the reverse 911. There are lots of people who don't have cell reception up in the foothills. And that same afternoon that I went up to Cohasset that we did the drill in Forest Ranch that morning, I spoke with a Cal Fire person who told me that the logging roads have changed so much and they have not had an update in their fire plan, in their evacuation plan in eight years. That's, that's too long. 
And so that's the kind of thing that could cost a life. So when I'm talking about communication systems, I'm also talking about when we did the evacuation last year, um, people had less than an hour to get from Orville out of their home. And so I want to see the countywide communications increased. Thank you. Mr. Wall. Butte County has an excellent uh, Office of Emergency Services uh, run by a senior staff person. We have, we have dam, Oroville Dam and Paradise Dam procedures that are coming into place uh, based on the recent incident last year. We have hostage uh, situation training uh, through the Sheriff's Department. We have, of course, the fire issue, uh, and we have mutual aid with uh, all of the local fire departments, and we have uh, aid from up and down the state and across the country for fires uh, should we need it. We have procedures in place to house, to feed, to take care of the off-duty firemen when they do come to Butte County to fight a fire. We have a very good and very capable staff that uh, manages this and it gets into place immediately upon a, the inclination of a, a major disaster of any kind. So you pick the disaster, uh, our people are prepared for it. Thank you. Ms. Lucero. Well, I would agree that um, there are a lot of good plans. I, I, too, have some concerns about communication just because of what we saw in Santa Rosa and um, Sonoma, just people not having uh, the same codes, the reverse calling, all of that. But one of the things that I have been thinking about is the fact that in, Ch or in Butte County, Chico is the largest city, 90,000 people. In the county, there are 80,000 people in the unincorporated parts of the county. How do we successfully get those people out when there is an emergency? That's a lot of folks. So, you know, think about the number of people that we have here in Chico, and then think about trying, you know, hopefully, obviously, um, the disaster will be in one area or another. But we need to start thinking about building codes and where we're building homes and how we're going to service those homes. Thank you. It's time for the closing statements. They drew to see who would go first for closing statement, and it will be Deborah Lucero, followed by Larry Wall, followed by Tammy Ritter, then Mr. Rosine, and Mr. Evans. So we'll start with Ms. Lucero. Okay, thank you. So um, this is the first time I've ever run for office. I have worked alongside uh, the county for many years uh, doing economic development, um, arts, culture, tourism, ag speed dating, just about everything you can imagine working with the county. And I truly love this county. And there are a lot of really great people who work for the county. We had the privilege today of going on a job shadow with the district attorney's office, and that was awesome to see all those hardworking people and the stacks of things that they're doing. What I'm really concerned about is defending our green line. I believe in the next four years that will be broken if I do not get in office. I want to protect our water, improve health care and human services, do something about homelessness, which I think we can do and the county needs to be front and center on, which will create quality of life and safer communities. So I am about safe communities. I'm just coming at it a little bit differently. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wall. Thank you, and thank you for uh, being so attentive tonight. Uh, it's been an interesting batch of questions we re received, and one that we didn't get was, why are we running for supervisor? Well, I'll tell you why I run. Uh, it's about public service. It's about service to my country, service to my community. I've been involved in public service since I was an Eagle Scout, in, in the Navy as a pilot, and when I got out, I became involved in, uh, in public, uh, public life here in Chico, serving on the Planning Commission and the City Council. I also serve on the, on the Salvation Army Advisory Board. I was there during our capital campaign when we built an adult rehabilitation center with 50 beds for recovering uh, alcoholics and addicts. I'm, I serve on the Butte Humane Society, and I'm a member of Jet Chico, as, as Norm leads it. It's, uh, it's a matter of serving the public, helping constituents get through the bureaucracy, get to the right people to do things, including fixing sewers on a Saturday night, including, I'll stop then, but you get the idea. Okay, Tammy Ritter, please. Hi. 
I'm Tammy Ritter, and I'm running for supervisor because I want to continue to be a public servant. I want to continue to serve the public in a way that is accessible and that I am available to people and able to listen. Uh, as a professional mediator, I am um, well versed in sitting in conflict, and I think that sometimes the decisions that have to be made for the county are hard decisions, and I think I can do that um, with a level head and objectively. I am the only District 3 candidate who was endorsed by the current District 3 Supervisor Maureen Kirk, and I would appreciate your vote. Thank you. Mr. Rosine? Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone again for being here. It's nice to actually have a group to talk to. It's, and she's laughing because often it's three or four people. Um, yeah, how about that? Uh, mom would be so proud. Uh, I'm running because of mom. Mom doesn't go downtown anymore, and mom doesn't go to the park anymore. Things have changed, and I think public safety is, is a big issue. Homelessness is a big issue. We need to solve those challenges. Um, I'm supported by the Butte County Sheriff's Association. Um, I'm supported by other law enforcement. I think that I can make a difference in working with them and trying to solve some of these issues. Uh, I'm the only candidate that has an ag background. I'm the only candidate that grew up in Chico. Um, I, 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 Chico's my hometown. I want us to be good as a community, safe as a community, and do the very best we can in everything that we do, and, and that's why I'm running. Thank you. And last, Mr. Evans. You know, something, there has to be something about that military background. Uh, when you're in the military, you, you live in a lot of different locations, but the problem is you're always on the outside. You're never part of the community. And you look, you see them on television, they're making decisions that affect everybody, but you really can't be a part of it. When I retired, since then, I have been deeply involved with Chico, and it just comes from the fact that you want to serve and you want to continue to serve. Uh, I've been on the city council. I'm currently on the planning commission for the Chico. For Chico. I've been a Rotarian for almost 25 years. Uh, I'm the president of Chico Community Scholarship Association. This year we're giving out almost $200,000 worth of scholarships to local area high school kids. And uh, I've also been a founding member of Hooked on Fishing, Not All Drugs, which is coming up a week from Saturday, folks. I hope to see you out there. Uh, I love this community. Uh, safety is my highest priority. I think it was a mistake when we shut down Fire Station 42, and I will work my hardest to keep uh, safety at the top and provide the other services that are necessary to run an efficient county. Thank you. Thanks for your time. <laughs> they do indeed deserve our applause, don't they? More information about these candidates and others throughout the state can be found on the Voters Edge website. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Butte County and BCAC-TV, we thank the candidates for participating in the lively forum this evening. And again, thank you so much. And I think we could applaud again. <laughs>